Okay. Thank you for letting me know. All right, we're going to head into the book here, and we're really, you know, how I like to teach, we don't want to and dwell on things that really don't concern alignment. And if you look at the book, it's electrical studies for trades. This built again, this book again is built for electricians. So it's not built for alignment, but we still use it. It still does have some good information. So we're going to uh, apply through some of these things. All right. Second paragraph that's here in the book. <clears throat> electrical sources are divided into two basic types, direct current DC and alternating current AC. Direct current is unidirectional. What do they mean by unidirectional? Anybody? What was that called? Sorry, Alex. Okay, no problem. Unidirectional means it goes one way. And the flow of DC electricity is from negative to positive. You would think it would be from positive to negative, but it's negative to positive. We're not going to dwell too much on DC, but we are going to do uh, most of our work on AC because AC is the method of transport and production in use in the alignment industry. All right. Uh, which means it flows in only one direction. The first part of this text will be devoted mainly to the study of direct current Alternating current is bidirectional, which means that it reverses its direction of flow at regular intervals. The latter part of this text is devoted mainly to the study of alternating current. So we will put a lot of emphasis on alternating current as we go through these texts. I'm on page two, we're skipping it. Page three, we're skipping it. Page four, we're skipping it. Page five, we're skipping it. And because I don't think you guys need to know about valence electrons and how an atom is made. Structure of the atom, electron orbits, we're skipping. Valence electrons, I'm going to go to the bottom of page 10 here. Uh, it is the valence electrons that are the primary concern of the study of electricity because if these electrons that explain much of the electrical theory, a conductor, for instance, is made of material that contains one or two valence electrons. Conductors are materials that permit electrons to flow through them easily. When an atom has only one or two valence electrons, the electrons are loosely held by the atom and are easily given up for current flow. So if we had to talk about it and kind of give examples out there, we know that there are specific elements as far as an atom are concerned that make a conductor but what are some of those good conductors what are they made of copper copper is probably top of the line right there what else was it silver 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 is actually number one that is the number one best conductor there is out there in the world uh, what else Gold. gold by your book. I'm on page uh, 12. Gold and platinum. Oh, shit. Oh, shoot. My... You okay? Okay. Uh, gold and platinum all contain balanced electrons that are excellent conductors of electricity. Silver is the best natural conductor of electricity, followed by copper, then gold, then aluminum. Now, as far as the industry is concerned today, what is the best, listen to the question closely, what is the best conductor newly installed in Lyman construction as far as the conductor is concerned? Silver, copper, gold, platinum, or aluminum? Silver. Aluminum. Aluminum. All right, Mr. Bailey, just think if I built a line from Conway to Myrtle Beach and the entire line was made out of silver. How much would that cost us? A lot. Yeah, tons of money. Okay. Uh, aluminum is now the best conductor to use as far as new construction is concerned. And when I say that, you will run out there into the world and start doing your work and you will run into copper. All right. There's going to be plenty of copper that's installed out there. But the cost of it has gotten so high that it's really not cost effective to install copper anymore. Aluminum is the best bet for the dollar. So that's the uh, less costliest to install. 
which means in turn, if copper was better than aluminum, that we might need to uh, raise the size. Sometimes sizing is a concern of the conductor, but even at that, aluminum is still cheaper. <clears throat> All right, still at the uh, page 12, electron flow. Electron current is the flow of electrons. There are several, uh, uh, and I want to give a disclaimer here when we're talking about it. Professor Verlin's probably heard this a hundred times. Okay. If you read that first paragraph right there, I'm going to emphasize something. Electric current is a flow of electrons. There are several theories. This has never been figured out to an absolute because you cannot see electric current flow under a microscope. It's just not there to see. Uh, you cannot see valence electrons going from one atom to the other. So these are all theories. They're good theories, I think, but they're still theories in concept. About, uh, there are several theories concerning how electrons are made to flow through a conductor. One theory is generally referred to as the bump theory. Now, I tend to agree more with the bump theory than I do with any other theory that's out there. There's another one that they use in, in this book and one more that's really not included in this book, but I tend to believe in the bump theory. It states that current flow is produced when an electron from one atom knocks electrons from another atom out of orbit. Okay, what's the name of that, uh, I keep forgetting this, that thing where you have the balls and they, they're, on, they're suspended like this, and you let go of one end, and it knocks the other end out. Newton's cradle. Newton's cradle. Okay, so the general theory, and this is theory right here, this is really rudimentary, kind of basic, is if I have a generator on one end, and I have a, say, light bulb or any kind of whatever I'm using here on the other end, that one electron is going to hit current flow. One electron is going to move on to another electron atom, and they're all going to bounce each other until one current electron flows out of the other end. So that's the theory. And that's how electric current flows. Now you'll notice something here. I kind of like to use this one. How, what direction is the current flowing in this one? Can you share your screen, Professor? Huh? Can you share your screen? Thought it was. Now I am. <laughs> Got it. Okay. All right. Think of this as we have some kind of generator on this side that's generated electricity. And at the other end, we're using electricity in some sort of way. And like I said, a light bulb before. And these are the atoms. And the atoms are bumping each other. And thus, you have current flow that comes out of the end. Now, there's something to watch that's happening here. And that's why I like to kind of like to use this video. All right, when we talked about the first uh, chapter up there in the first paragraph, how many directions does AC flow? Unidirectional or bidirectional? Bidirectional. Bidirectional. It goes forward and back. 
forward and back. Same thing in Newton's cradle here. Energy is being transferred forward and back. It is quite bizarre to watch. Okay, like I said, that's the theory. And I tend to kind of believe that theory more, that in a conductor, uh, electrons are bumping each other and current flow occurs when you apply voltage to it and current flows out of one end and back in the opposite direction. And we'll talk more about how many times per second later on, but that's the theory that we're gonna stick with. Okay. If you turn over, if you got your books, if you turn over to page uh, 14, you'll see the same kind of concept that they're giving right there on a pool table. The guy hits a cue ball, the cue ball hits another ball. The cue ball, once it hits it, is gonna stay in place and that next ball is gonna proceed in motion out. All right, what kind of uh, time we're looking at here? All right, not too bad. All right, the bottom of page 15. Materials that are made of atoms that contain seven or eight valence electrons are known as insulators. Insulators are materials that resist the flow of electricity. Can we also say impede? Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah, I, I agree too. It impedes the flow of electricity. When the valence shell of an atom is full, it's almost full of electrons. The electrons are tightly held and not easily given up. What are some good examples of an insulative material? Rubber. Rubber. But it's something that you always need to put right at the top of the list because you're going to be using it a lot as far as your tooling and your equipment. And like ceramic or uh, fiberglass. Fiberglass, exactly. Fiberglass is the top of the list there. Uh, ceramic or porcelain, yes sir. Anything else? Wood, glass. Uh, Got to watch out on the plastic. Some plastics nowadays are not made to be what good insulators, even though it does say plastic. But uh, fiberglass is the top of your list. Does anybody remember, as far as the industry is concerned, what kind of insulation insulation you have? when you're using a fiberglass tool or a fiberglass piece of equipment. What's the insulation value? Something to put down there in your notes, gentlemen. 100,000 volts per foot. So if I have a stick, and I've seen you, know you guys have seen us out there in the yard that we, where we used that extension stick before, and we've run it up in the air and uh, it's made out of fiberglass. If that's a 40 foot stick and it's got 100,000 volts of insulation per foot, how much total insulation in that stick do we have overall? 40 times 100,000. 400,000. 40 times 100,000, 40. Didn't you say 1,000 volts per foot, not 100,000? 100,000 kV. Oh, okay. I thought you said just volts. Well, Sorry, that's... 100, I said 100 kV per foot. So it's 100,000 volts per foot. And we've got a 40 foot stick. Four million. Four million volts. You got four million volts of insulation from end to end on that stick. Now granted, stick's gotta be clean, stick's gotta be dry. All the conditions have to be good, but still, four million volts of insulation is plenty. Uh, the boom on the line truck, when we've run out that third stage boom and it's made out of fiberglass, how much insulation is in that boom per foot? hundred kV. There you go. There you go. It's a standard in the industry. Every foot that you run out of that third stage that comes out of the line truck that's fiberglass, every foot that you put out there, it's 100,000 volts of insulation. All right, I'm on page 17. We'll talk about semiconductors here and then we'll take a little break. Semiconductors. Semiconductors are materials that are neither good conductors 
uh, nor good insulators. They contain four balanced electrons. Semiconductors are also characterized by the fact that they are, when that, as, the, as they are heated, excuse me, their resistance decreases. This is the opposite of a conductor, which increases its resistance with an increase in temperature. So they're going and they're starting to talk about temperature a little bit. If I have a conductor of aluminum, okay. okay, if I have an aluminum conductor and it's stretching 100 feet and the temperature is 100 degrees outside, is it, is it a good conductor compared to a conductor that's the same length and it's 20 degrees outside? Is heating my conductor make it less conductive? Is my, is my question. All right, I'll flip the question around. If I super cool a conductor, will it conduct better? No. <laughs> you remember what I just said here in the book? This is the opposite of a conductor which increases its resistance with the increase of temperature. So resistance becomes higher in a conductor as the temperature increases. If I decrease the temperature in a conductor, that resistance goes away. It is actually becomes a better conductor. You can actually take a conductor and cool it or super cool it and it can contain carry more amps than it usually would in a normal outside environment. All right. Semiconductors have become extremely important in their electrical industry since the inventions of the transistor in 1947. Well, we're not going to get into all the electronics of where a semiconductor is used. It's really used only in one instance. And I'll show you what that is. Hold on one second. As far as our industry is concerned. What you've got here, you see that, Professor V? Yes, sir. Uh, what you've got here is a picture of an underground primary cable. And if I was to guess here, probably, I cannot read the side of it, probably right around one fifteen thousand volt cable. And I'll just tell you the parts here real quick until we get to the semiconductor. This is the outer jacket, red stripe to denote electricity. This is your ground and neutral. This is the semiconductor right in here. This is the insulation. This is the conductor sheath or cover, and that's the actual conductor itself inside. That's what carries the voltage inside. The semiconductor on the outside of this is really a little bit just to save money. Instead of going completely around the conductor with one solid piece of copper or aluminum as your ground, they put a semiconductor here that semiconductor, if you have a fault in the cable, will become heated and that fault will go straight to ground. I know it's a little bit technical right here, but you, you want your faults to happen in underground cable as quickly as possible. So you're able to splice, splice the cable back together rather than having it burn a lot. So that's really the only case, and that's the piece of it right there, where you're going to be using a semiconductor We'll talk more about it in underground in the uh, electrical alignment world. That's the only location you're going to see it. Uh, Robbie, do you know of any other? I know of no other. Yeah. So that's the only one. If somebody says, well, and we'll talk about this when we go into splicing underground cables and terminating uh, tools and whatnot, you'll know where the semiconductor is on a underground primary conductor. This is not on overhead. This is not on secondaries only underground primary cable.
Okay, well, it's about what? 9.45, okay. 9.43 by my book. Let's say, uh, come back at 10 o'clock. Let's take a little break. 60. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody can answer. Yeah. 60 times a second. Bang. Bam. 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 There you go. So this happens 60 times per second. 60 times per second, you get one full sine wave out of your generated electricity. That's one full. Up, peak, middle, down, peak, back to middle. 60 times per second. So essentially, how many times per one sine wave do I have zero voltage going to the light bulb? Per sine wave, one, three. Two, Three, three, correct. Now our eyes are not fast enough to see it. And it's happening at 60 times per second. So really, you cannot look at a light bulb and see that it's going on and off three times per sine wave. Or every 1 60th of a second. Because there's 60 hertz, 60 times per second. I was about to ask you that because I was looking and I can't see it. Right, right. Uh, our, our visual acuity. Now, if you took a light bulb and you put a video camera to it and you took it at high speed, you can actually so it, and there's videos out there, see it going dim and bright, but it really never has time to go completely dim because it's so fast. But I did, you know, this, this is the you know, concept. This is how AC works. Actually, one, two, three times per sine wave, there is zero voltage going to the lamp. Now, we talked about this before in math. When I raise my voltage, what does the current do? Go up or down? If I raise voltage, my current goes up or down? Anybody? Oh. When you raise current, Excuse me, when you raise voltage, current drops. When you lower voltage, current raises. And it's really, if you want to talk to it in kind of like uh, easy terms, it's supply and demand. The light bulb wants current. It needs it for it to, to light itself up. If there's no voltage pressure, to push the current down, then the current is going to raise. I want more. I need more. You're not giving it to me. So the current demand is going to raise. Once I have that high voltage, hey, you're pushing it to me real well. The pressure is very good. Remember, voltage is electrical pressure. Then my current is going to go down. I don't need that much current anymore because you're pushing electricity so much better with electrical pressure. So keep that, write that down in your notes. It's going to happen multiple times out there in the world. And uh, it actually went back to the computations that you made before. Remember in, when we did the transformers in math, you had 7,200 and 240. So that was a one to 30 ratio. So if I had one amp on the primary side, how many amps did I have in the secondary side? 30. Well, what happened to the voltage there? I had 7,200 on top and 240 on the bottom. So every one amp at 7,200 is 30 amps at 240 volts. We've talked about this a hundred times. My voltage lowered, my amperage raised to 30. Go the opposite direction. My amperage is 30 at 240. What is it at 7,200? It is one because my voltage raised. So keep that concept, put it down in your notes. Let's watch out the rest of the video. Okay, we need to define a couple of things. First is the change from start to finish is called a cycle. The rate <clears throat> at which a cycle repeats is frequency. Now, frequency is measured using the unit hertz, which means cycles per second. Different parts of the world use different frequencies.
frequencies for their AC systems, and it can either be 50 or 60 hertz. What this means is in one second, the cycle will repeat itself at least 50 times. Believe it or not, incandescent bulbs are- All right, that's in Europe. The United States, Canada, all use a 60 hertz frequency. Uh, Europe uses 50 hertz. We're actually flashing over 50 times per second. Now it turns out that this rate is so fast that our slow human eyes sees it as constant light. In summary, while the abbreviations for AC and DC include the word current, they can be used to describe different types of voltage and current. DC voltages do not fluctuate while DC current flows in one direction. AC voltages change over time and the current flow can alternate direction. If you have questions about this video, please feel free to leave comments below for more electronics tutorial. Okay. Any questions there as far as that's concerned? We're, we're going to get into a lot of AC <coughs> sine waves and AC current and how the sine wave and the frequency work. That's really just an introductory right there. I the biggest thing, sir. Since we're talking about light bulbs and things like that, um, so my range, you know, that has a light bulb on the inside so you can see what's going on, right? The range in my kitchen. That light bulb seems to need to be replaced often compared to a light bulb in your ceiling. So can you explain why I keep having to replace that light bulb so much when I heating, have it? heating, constant heating, heating, as far as a conductor is concerned, and I know Professor B has seen this before out there in the world, heating and cooling of a conductor, any kind of conductor, even the filament of a light, right. degrades it. All right, so a regular light bulb that's in your ceiling, it's not having that heating and cooling as, as severe as a light bulb that's gonna go into your stove. You know, you push it up to 300 degrees or whatever you're cooking at. It's not gonna have the same kind of heating properties. And really, <coughs> I've seen copper conductor, I've seen aluminum conductor that has gotten very hot and it actually becomes really, really flexible. It's good. They call it soft, that soft conductor. Whereas it was usually, you know, had high tensile strength and was pretty hard and conducted very well. After heating and cooling, heating and cooling, the conductor actually became soft and would not, it was easily breakable. Well, the filament in the light bulb that you're heating and cooling like that eventually is going to break and fall away and not be able to uh, light anymore because of the constant heating and cooling that's happening. Okay. Okay. Good question. I just could feel like I've never, I don't know if it's because of the way ranges are made nowadays. You've got to replace stuff more often, but I've never done it so often. I don't know if it was. Where'd you, what kind is it? Is it fairly new? It's a frigid air one. It's maybe three years old. Yeah. But it's got like a cover over the bulb so to protect it. And obviously the bulb is for like, for that purpose. But yeah, I'm like, don't know if it's like some kind of excessive power being used in that circuit. To no, no. If, if you don't see it getting over bright, then you'd be able no. to tell that, that it gets. How do they use it? Huh? How do they ever use the, rain, the, the, the light? But every time you open the door, the light comes on. Mm-hmm. So it's like an automatic thing and then you would turn it on while it was closed if you wanted to you know look at what's going on but look at look at the thanksgiving turkey in there yeah yeah stuff like that but i don't know i don't know if the way the bulb is made is bad too so yeah it might be a cheap bulb but still i mean the constant heating and cooling of any kind of conductor that you put into a circuit is going to degrade it and that's it's typical of a range all right okay it. you bet all right, so I'm on, on to page uh, 22 as far as the book is concerned. We're not going to really get too much into the Coulomb. <laughs> You'll see that, and that's C-O-U-L-O-M-B. We are going to discuss a good bit about the amp. So the next electrical measurement to be discussed is the amp or ampere. The ampere is named for a scientist named Andre Ampere, who lived in the late 1700s to early 1800s. <clears throat> Ampere is the most famous for his work dealing with electromagnetism, which will be discussed later in the chapter in this text. The amp is defined as one coulomb per second. 
Well, I don't really don't need you to worry about what the coulombs are. You got that, Professor V? Yep. Thank you. Uh, one coulomb, notice that the definition of an amp involves the quantity measurement of the coulomb combined with time. Measurement of one second. All right, they go into more detail of a coulomb flow per second, blah, blah, blah. If you've got your book, the great example that we talked about before is in the top of page 23. And what are they using for uh, an example? A water line, a water line and a pump. The amp, if we had to define it as far as we're concerned as electrical linemen, how do we define that? How do we say what the amp is? It's the electrical pressure? Yeah. Is it the electrical Resistance? Electrical flow. It's the electrical flow. It's the flow of electrons and electricity down a conductor of wire. So it's the electric flow. Uh, just like you see in that pump right there, you see how they're going from a one size pipe to a much smaller pipe and then to a bigger pipe? It's a great example right there. <laughs> I will only get as much flow as the smallest pipe in that circuit. And it's the same thing for a conductor. Anytime that you have a conductor out there, I'm able to get more flow on the larger conductor size that I have. The smaller the conductor, the smaller amount of current flow, amperes or amps, I'm able to apply to that conductor. Now what happens, give me uh, any kind of ideas, what's gonna happen to a conductor if I put too many amps on it, I overrate the conductor. It's gonna get really hot. Well, I heard Paul, Paul what was yours? It's gonna trip. Uh, conductor has no, it, it can't walk. It's not gonna trip over a rock or anything. <laughs> okay. There's no, there's no trip. I'm just talking about a conductor in free space. We have a conductor that's rated for 100 amps, and on that conductor, we apply 300 amps. What's going to happen to the conductor? I heard somebody else out there, too. It's going to melt. Well, really I, I, I like the way Benjamin, but the way you kind of stated that right there, it's going to get really, really hot for one, correct? And you're going to have a, a like a domino problem going on here. Once we get it superheated like that, we're going to go back to what we just discussed about a minute ago is once I get a conductor hot, then it becomes resistive and doesn't conduct as well. So one, we're overheating it and eventually we're just going to melt the conductor down. It's going to be so hot. It's going to break and span and melt down and come to the ground. So that's what happens uh, when we overrate our conductor. All right. So amp, concerns electric flow, the flow of current down a conductor. All right, they go through different uh, theories and whatnot, the conventional theory of DC, the electron theory of uh, DC. I'm, I like to stay with the bump theory. And let me get this video up here. This is pretty cool to watch. How? Fast is electricity. Okay, so without me, I'll start. Get through the commercial. I know. Okay, so I'll ask right off the bat, how fast is electricity? How fast do you think it is? Take a guess. Speed of light. All right. The speed of light. All right, uh, any other guesses? 300 million meters per second. 300 million meters per second. Well, let's watch the video. How fast does an electron move down a wire? Which would we gonna so you know it's kind of a he's kind of cheating you here. How fast are electrons 
and electricity. Is this about to bomb out? Do you still see my screen? I think he froze up. Yeah, I froze. Am I back? Uh, your video's froze, but we can hear you. Well, I'm still, I've got that paused. Oh, yeah? Okay. okay. Let me see what happens here. Do you see, uh, do you see, still see it up on the screen? Yeah. How fast? Okay. They're, they're, they're kind of deceiving you here. How fast are electrons and electricity? Well, electrons <clears throat> are at one speed and electricity is at another. And I can see the wheel turn. It looks like I was going to. Yeah, it, keep, it keeps popping in and out. V, can you bring up you, uh, this video? Yeah, I'm looking for it now. Okay. Just type. Our snail. Let's answer the second question first. You may be surprised to learn that the snail would win easily. Let's use this electrical circuit as a racetrack. It has an on off switch. Well, everybody get, did you get that? Yep. Uh, I'm just not going to go full screen. I'm just going to leave it like this. All right, here we go. Uh, you would think, and then I was go back to this, you would think that electrons and electricity are at the same speed, and he's kind of deceiving you here. Electrons refers to the current flow, and electricity he is referring to is as a voltage. Here we go. Move down a wire. Which would win in a race, electron or snail? Let's answer the second question first. You may be surprised to learn that the snail would win easily. Let's use this electrical circuit as a racetrack. It has an on-off switch, a battery, and a light. The distance around our racetrack is 22 inches. According to the 1999 World Almanac and Book of Facts, a garden snail can move at a whopping 0 0.03 miles per hour. That's 0.528 inches per second. What we'll color, John? The 1998 Guinness Book of World Records says that a garden snail named Archie went to whopping 13 inches in two minutes. That's 0.108 inches per second. This is Archie. And here's our electron. We'll talk about how fast it moves later. And they're off. Archie and Joan roar ahead with the electron. Well, it's moving, but it doesn't look like it yet. Joan's in the lead, and Joan zooms ahead, Archie behind, and then the electron. Well, this will take all day, so let's fast forward it. And the winner is Joan, with Archie well behind, but our electron has moved a mere one-tenth of an inch. But doesn't electricity move at the speed of light? The speed of light is around 300,000 kilometers per second, or 186,000 miles per second. Actually, in an unshielded copper wire like this one, electricity moves at around 96% the speed of light. Okay. Uh, I'll kind of stop it right here just to open the question up. So if we travel at 186,000 miles per second, that's the speed of light. Why is he only going to go to 96% of that? Maybe because there's resistance somewhere. Hey, thank you very much. There's resistance, gentlemen, in everything. Even the best conductor has resistance. All right, so he's using this copper conductor around here. The light bulb actually has resistance in it. The battery has resistance in it, and the switch too. So there's resistance around this entire circuit right here. How he came up with the math of 96%, that's to be unknown. He's just using his measurement of wire. But there's resistance in everything that's out there. Uh, we call it impedance. So that's why he's not going to use the full 186,000 miles per second. He's going to take only 96% of it. So 178,560 miles per second. At that speed, ignoring other losses, electricity could circle the globe over seven times in just one second. So electricity moves at close to the speed of light, but the electrons don't, as we saw with our little racetrack. One way to visualize what's going on is to use this roll of marbles. When we push on one marble, the effect of that push is passed on from marble to marble, and the result is felt by the wooden tile almost immediately. Okay, so now we're talking, he was talking voltage before as far as the measurement is concerned. Now he's talking current flow. So if I apply voltage from the battery at this end, and I bump an electron, it's going to bump the next electron, and one's going to flow out the other end. Uh, Shoemaker, that video is not playing for me. How about you, V? I see it. Your, your um, camera's froze up, but the video's still playing. Okay. Yeah, the video's not playing for me. All I can hear is the audio. Marbles represent individual electrons. They don't move very far along the way. 
electricity is represented by the effect on the wooden tile. That effect is passed on almost immediately. And to answer our other question, how fast are the electrons moving? The electrons move at a velocity called the drift velocity. Here's one easy formula we can use. Okay, so he gets on to further conversation of drift velocity. We didn't, don't need to know all that. The thing we, that we do need to know Wow, this thing's starting to hose up. The thing that we, uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah, I hit stop sharing, it's still sharing. Yeah. <laughs> is that electricity itself, as far as voltage is concerned, does travel at the speed of light minus the resistance or uh, impedance of a conductor. Amperage, on the other hand, flows very slowly from one end of a conductor to the other because of the bump theory. You still hear me, V? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm, I'm sitting here on a black screen. Here you go. Okay, you go. All right, and I'm out of share finally. Okay. All right, so we'll, that takes care of, let's see, page 25, the speed of current, which is very, very slow. And then we'll talk about, we're on page 26, how, what we need to have for electricity to work as far as powering something. And Professor V? Wattage. Uh, well, I'm gonna. I'm sitting here on a grindy wheel right now, and I have nothing in my Zoom. Yeah. So there it goes. Yeah, we're back. All right. So wattage. Yeah, what uh, Professor V referred to on page 26 and 27 is the actual consumption. Well, what do we have to have to be able to consume electricity and be able to use it? And I'll get over here and I hope this works because everything's starting to hose up. What time is it? It is uh, 1034. All right. Let's take about 11. Give me to about 1045 here and see if I can get this squared away, okay? Right on. So I'll take a break. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. 